And thank you very much for the invitation. So today we'll talk about resonances as a computational tool, and this is a novel numerical integration technique I was working in the last couple of weeks, of uh, years. And please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or remarks or even better some suggestions. Okay, so generally speaking, what we understand very well in numerical analysis nowadays, probably as in the analysis of PDEs, are smooth solutions. So for instance, if we think about the Schrödinger equation with some smooth data, then we can take more or less any decent numerical scheme and we could get a good approximation to the, to the solution. This, however, drastically changes if we go to the regime of non-smooth solutions. So for instance, here you see the so-called Talbot effect. So I solved the cubic 1D NLS with a step function initial value. And then we see in the exact solution some rough patterns appear. And then what we see numerically, if we use, for instance, the strength fitting method, I will explain in a bit what this is, but it's one of the most famous methods to use to simulate the Schrödinger equation. We see that the strength fitting method does not capture all this rough pattern in the exact solution. Okay, and so in the last years I was working and on the questions in how far can we develop numerical schemes which also allow us to reproduce rough patterns in dispersive equations. And so before, uh, so let me present as a model problem um, of this re uh, the resonance-based approach for the KDV equation. So the cultivated freeze equation is a model for shallow water waves and mathematically is described as the time evolution of the solution is driven by the third order differential operator dx q and then with the Burgers nonlinear. And now before I present this resonances approach, let me first give a general overview on classical numerical methods, such as a splitting method or an exponential integrator method for this equation. Because in order to get the idea for this new resonance-based approach, we first have to understand why do classical methods fail and when do they fail. And so one of the most famous methods also for the KDV equations are splitting methods. So the general idea behind splitting methods is you have a complicated problem, you take this complicated problem, you split it into a series of simpler subproblems, you solve your simpler subproblems, either you can do it exactly or you use a numerical scheme, and then you compose the flows of the subproblems to get an approximation to the original solution of the equation. And so, for instance, if we look at the KDV equation, numerically speaking, we have two main difficulties. We have the dx cubed, so this differential operator, and then we have the Burgers nonlinearity. And so, the simple idea of the splitting approach is the following instead of considering the full problem, in the first step, we forget about the nonlinearity in our equation, and we simply look at the free equation, so dtu plus dx cubed u is zero. And then in the second step, we forget about the differential operator and we only solve the nonlinear non -linear problem, which in this case is the Burgess equation. And now if you think about these two sub problems from a numerical point of view, if we forget about the spatial discretization, of course we have a PD in time and space, so we have to apply some time and spatial discretization. But if for the moment we only think about time discretization, then we can solve this exactly. Okay, so we know can write, exactly write down the flow. Also, if you think about Spatial discretization, we can, for instance, use if we have periodic boundary conditions, spectral methods, and we can also compute this exactly. And then for the Burgess equation, of course, we can use the method of characteristics. Again, if we think about the spatial discretization, we have to be careful because with the methods of characteristics, we do not necessarily end up on the grid points anymore. But for a time, for if we only think about the time evolution in the system, we can solve these two. Um, so equations <coughs> exactly, and then the basic idea is how do you split the initial conditions. The initial conditions I do not split. So now comes, of course, I do not I do not want the approximation to the sub problems, but for the full equation. So I start with an initial condition. Okay. So I start here. Let's say u is zero, and then let's say this would be the exact flow. Okay. So here I have phi with time step tau, exact, and this just takes my initial value and maps it. Oops to the exact solution at time tau, okay? And now the splitting idea is instead of following the exact flow, you take the initial value, you transport it, for instance, first you solve the nonlinear equation, okay? So here you make phi tau nonlinear, okay? So here you solve the subproblem as q, and then you take this as initial condition, and then you solve the linear problem, okay? So here you would solve oh, okay. phi t. Thank you for the question, Linia. Oh, Sorry, thank you. probably you cannot read this. And then, of course, the question, so then you end up somewhere here, and this would be u1, so this is the, um, the numerical solution after, after one step, and of course, what we want to know is how close we are to the exact solution, 
Okay, and that not only after one step, but if you want to um, solve the PD on zero to capital T, we have to iterate. And then, this, so this is the called, so called least splitting method. Then you can also think about a symmetrized version of this, which is the so called strength splitting method. So the idea of the strength splitting method is you take the initial value, you propagate it with a half time step um, nonlinear, then a full time step linear, and then half step um, nonlinear again. Okay. And um, so, and then the question of, uh, uh, of course, one question numerically speaking is how can I implement it? But the other question is, and this is more the questions I'm interested in, um, how can I prove conversions of these methods? And interestingly, it was only, I think, 10 years ago um, where people could show the first rigorous convergence bound of this method. So, really, after, uh, after iterating this method, show a convergence bound. So, how if I take my exact solution at time tn, where tn is n times my time step size. And then I take my numerical approximation. So I iterate the strength splitting method up to the time I want to solve. And then the first one uh, who could actually prove a reverse convergence estimate were Holden, Carlson, Lubit, Riso, and Terence Tau. And they could show that if I measure the error between the exact and numerical solution in H1, then with the strength splitting method, I get the tau square. So I get second order convergence. Okay. This is basically due to the fact that the strength splitting method is a symmetric method. So you always have even order in your in an even order method. And then what you need in order to really control this error and have this rate of conversions, you need H6 solutions. Okay. So basically what you need is you need smooth solutions in order to have this convergence. And secondly, what they assume in the in the global error estimate, you assume that the, you solve the Burgess equation exactly. Yeah, and if you only think about the time discretization, this is no problem. But if you also have a spatial discretization, you have to uh, you, you don't end up on the quick points anymore. So you have to use an approximation here, and then you have to make sure that this error you are um, doing here in the non when solving the nonlinear problem doesn't propagate. Okay, and with burgers, you have to be careful because you, know, you can go into shocks and so on. But um, as far as I know, there's no fully discrete so time and spatial um, discretization error analysis. Okay, so before I go to this resonance method, let me point out another um, a classical method to solve the KDV equation that are so-called exponential integrator methods. And so the idea behind exponential integrator methods is that you do not discretize the equation itself, but you discretize Duhamel's formula, okay? So for the KDV equation, if we write down Duhamel's formula, we have the um, uh, free KDV flow, exponential minus T, dx cube acting on initial value. And then we have the inter basically the integral over the um, KDV flow exponential s dx cube acting on the nonlinearity. And the simple idea behind exponential integrator methods is now if I imagine that my t is not so big, so I always solve my PD on my time discretization between zero and tau. If my t is not so big, my solution will not um, change so much between C and T and the basic idea of exponential integrators is just to freeze the nonlinearity, then you can pull it out of your integral and then you can solve the integral over the free KDV flow exactly. And this is a small error you make if you have smoothness in your solution and in the construction of your numerical scheme, you just um, neglect the error. Okay, and so you just build the numerical scheme on this thing. And so basically, this is the first order exponential integrator method. You take your initial value, then you propagate it with the integra integral over the free KDV flow, and then you add the first term in your Okay. <coughs> and then again, the question is, what can you say about the conversions of this method? And what you see easily is what is the local error, because basically this is just what you produce when you, when you do this approximation in the integral. Okay. So basically, you have a dx because you have KDV, so you have a dx from Burgers, and then you just, what you do is a Taylor series expansion, so you have DTU, then you look into your equation, what is the worst term, and then what you see is that you produce an error of dx for u. Okay, so basically, you can say that your local errors that just, um, um, when you construct a numerical scheme, needs four additional derivatives on the solution. Are these for local time estimates, or do they apply to... Yeah, I suppose you'd have to use conservation laws if you wanted something global. Yes, exactly. So global, see, these are all local. Also, oh. this other, also this was splitting methods. It was okay. exactly. So oh. what we do for the moment is very brutal. I come to long time estimates. What we do at some point, we use Cornwall, and then we always get something like this. And then yeah. so you don't use the anymore. Not for the moment. 
Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I'm impatient. Yes, so, please. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> sorry. Okay. I don't want to be more. I just want maybe. Yeah, okay. So let me go quicker. And what was somewhat surprising is that if you add the local area, you can control easily. You just need some regularity because it's Taylor series expansion. You know exactly what you what you introduce as an error. But then if you want to you you. You want to carry the error analysis, so a global error analysis in the sense you don't want to make one time step, but really further to go up to the time you want to solve your PDE. Then the error analysis is no longer trivial, at least not for me, and you really need to use some discrete Bogen type spaces to obtain an error estimate. So I will come back to this later. But somehow at this point, I was um, somehow curious how, I mean, the creative equation is such a fundamental model, completely integrable. Why do classical methods need so much smoothness? And why is it so difficult to show convergence of these methods? And so if you want to understand this, we have to understand the underlying structure of the KDV solution in a better way. In order to understand the underlying structure of the KDV solution, basically what we do is we again go back to Duhamel's formula. And then in order to have a rough idea of the solution, we just iterate Duhamel's formula. And then we see that the underlying structure of the KDV solution is written by the nonlinear frequency in the action of exponential STX cubed and exponential minus STX cubed. And so now if I want to see in how far my numerical method um, approximates the solution in a good way, the structure of the solution, I have to see in how far my numerical method embeds these nonlinear frequency interactions. And this is where you clearly see and easily see why the splitting, so this classical method splitting and exponential integrator methods fail, because what these methods do, they approximate the frequency interactions in a linear way. Okay, so if you look at the splitting method, what it does, it just treats these nonlinear frequency in the actions as if you would have a linear problem. So of course, if F would be linear, these frequency in the actions would cancel, but in a general case, this is not. <coughs> okay, and exponential integrator methods, on the other hand, just swallow all the frequency. Okay. And this is somehow the, 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 the problem because all these classical methods, they stem from linear ODE theory, and then it was um, um, people adapted them to nonlinear PDEs. But the, the, and of course, if you have smoothness, there's no problem because you can just do a Taylor Swiss expansion and the frequencies will not introduce any problems. And like this linearization of frequency in the actions, you also see, if we go back a moment, okay, in the splitting approach, because basically, so if you do the splitting, so you have solved your subproblem, dt u plus dx cubed, dx cubed is zero. And you solve your subproblem S2, DTU, C plus one half, DXU square is zero. Okay. And now what I mean with the with the with not taking frequency interactions into account, if I, when I'm in the uh, when I solve my subproblem S1, if I would change here my nonlinearity, I would not at all change in how, how I solve my subproblem S1. Okay. And on the other hand, if I, if when I'm solving my subproblem, my nonlinear subproblem, I do not at all take into account my, how my differential operator looks like, because I would solve it exactly in the same way if I would have a different, different differential operator. Okay, so basically the splitting method, as you split the problem, it doesn't take these interactions into account. Okay, and also the exponential integrator method. So it, it does the, 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 how you transport your flow, it does not take at all into account how your nonlinearity looks like. Okay, now, um, of course, you can say, okay, this is maybe some technicality you need for your proof, all this smoothness, but then in numerics, what you can do is you can always um, check your convergence numerically and see whether you actually need the smoothness in your solution. And so here you see a convergence plot. So what we see is the time step size, and here we see the error. And um, here is a curve of slope one and of slope two. And so for a first order method, you would assume that the convergence is parallel to the first order line. And for a second order method, you would assume that the method is parallel to the second order line. And the least splitting and the exponential integrator are first order method. So you would expect a convergence like this. And then you see that the convergence is not retained. Okay, because this is really due to the fact that if you if you are not regular enough, then you really see that these classical methods have order. <laughs> And what you also see is that the least splitting method and the strength splitting method have the same error behavior. So for low regularity data, it also does not make sense to use high order methods. Okay, and now coming to the to to the to the question you asked already. So in how far can we um, um, somehow adapt our numerical schemes better to the structure of the equation and probably um, um, 
you all have the idea now already how we could do this. Namely, the, the, the essential idea will be to really embed these nonlinear interactions into, into your numerical scheme. Okay, so if we want the first order scheme, we can again just, if, if, if we, this is again Duhamel's formula iterated, if we want to have a first order scheme, we can just neglect the higher order iterations. Okay, and then what we have to do is we somehow have to construct a numerical scheme which embeds these nonlinear footprints interactions. And this is where, uh, and this is um, in the KDV equation quite simple. So, what can we do? We write down, so what we want to have, if we want to have a, a, a good a numerical scheme which embeds these frequency interactions, so I write down this postulatory integral again. And then what you can do is you just Okay, if we assume periodic boundary conditions, we can just go to Fourier space because then we can explicitly write down how these nonlinear interactions look like. Okay, so you just expand, so you have a, a quadratic nonlinearity, so you expand into VK hat and VL hat, you have K plus L is M, and then you have a, a one M term because you have burgers, so you have the X, and then you can collect all the frequency interactions um, in <coughs> resonance. Okay? And so this is just a short calculation how these frequency interactions look like. And for the KDV equation, what you see is that, um, so you have a minus M cube, this comes from the operator acting on the full nonlinearity, then you have a K cube and an L cube because of this quadratic nonlinearity and the flows acting on the functions. And then what you can simply do is you, and this is somehow the miracle for us numerically, these frequency interactions, they factorize. Okay, so you can just put this here into your resonances, and then you can simply solve the integral exactly. And so this we do, so we did this oscillatory integral, we can um, solve the oscillations exactly and just write them down. And this will be exactly what we embed in our scheme. Okay, so we do not do any approximation. And this is in, in contrast to the splitting method or the exponential integrator method, because the splitting method, what would the splitting method do? It would just approximate all these resonances by zero. And what would the exponential integrator method do? It would just approximate all these resonances by the leading term n. And now this is a, a more subtle term, uh, a more subtle thing. What, what in numerical analysis is, in, is, is important is that you cannot only resolve all of them, but you can also have an efficient numerical scheme. Okay. And basically this means what we would like to do is to have differentiation in Fourier space and function multiplication in physical space. Because what we would not like to do is to compute everything in Fourier space. Because, OK, if you think about KDV, it's 1D, you have a quadratic nonlinearity. But if you think about higher dimensions and higher nonlinearities, then you would have um, uh, uh, too many sums that it would not be computational efficient. And so what you want to do is you want to use the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, to switch between Fourier space and physical space. Carry a differentiation in Fourier space and then move back to physical space for function multiplication. And for the KDV equation, this works very well because you really have a factorization of frequencies. <coughs> Unfortunately, for other equations, this does not work so well and we have to have a little bit of a pain. Okay. And so this is the basic idea for the KDV equation. Instead of applying some linearization of frequencies, what classical methods would do, we really embed all these nonlinear interactions into the numerical scheme. Okay, and now let us, um, this is the scheme we, we, we developed together with Martina Hoffmanova. And um, so let us look at the numerical simulation here. So for the KDV equation, what is nice, we know that solitone solutions exist. So solitone solutions do not change the shape. And so it's a very nice test model for numerics because you can you know the exact solution. So you can really compare the numerical scheme to something you know exactly. And so what you see in the simulation is you see the time evolution of the solitone from T0 to 21 to 24, so it's not even long time, 24 is so big. And then you see in um, yellow dotted um, the exact solution. In blue star, you see the exponential integrator method. The splitting method would behave um, similarly. And in red, you see this new resonance based scheme. And so, uh, of course, at the initial value, everything is the same. And then you move in time. And then you see that the exponential integrator method is already up. And if you would zoom in, you would see that an instability built up here. And then if you integrate longer in time, then the exponential integrator method blows up, okay, because it cannot resolve the equation in a good way, whereas the resonance-based approach stays close to the, to, the, to, to, the, to, the, to the solitone solution. 
And this is this is interesting because this is even for smooth solutions. Okay, so even for smooth solutions, numerically we see that the exponential integrator method does not stay close to to the actual solution. Do you know what the step size was here for this one? I, I don't know. So you would think if you make it really really small, yes. eventually you should. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So so sometimes you also have like this what's called CFL condition where you have to have a connection between delta t and delta x. And then you can resolve this. But in especially long time simulations, you would not want to do this because you want to use large step, step size. Otherwise, you would uh, compute forever. Uh, like, I guess that here, the step size was similar for your method and the exponential. Exactly. Sorry, this is important. So I took, otherwise, it would be a bit cheap. And, <laughs> and like your method was working also on TLT equal to 500, or that's it was a, breaking for 30? That's, a, that's an interesting question. So, what we, what I will show some energy. So energy simulations later on where we can really go over long times, but for the solution at some point it will also break down. And we can also not show anything. Um, 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 the, the convergence results also, I have to say, are always restricted to finite time because in our error estimate, so the error attack here and in any similar norm, we always have. Yes, for example, in this particular case, to get a comparison, here it was breaking for t equal to 24, the exponential yes. integrator method. And your method was breaking for another number. Yes. But this number is okay. But much, much longer. Yes. So we will see it in the energy, because in the energy, we really hope we can prove something at some point. But it, I was surprised that it, that because even for smooth solutions, it's classical. So somehow I understand that for rough solutions, it's difficult for classical methods. But even for smooth solutions, you cannot, don't, cannot have anything nicer than solid solutions. These classical methods. Okay. And then, of course, this worked very well for the KDV equation. And then the question was, what is about a more general class of dispersive equations? So, or even if you move away from dispersive equations, and so if you have a general dispersive equation where you have some operator which may trigger oscillations in space and or in time, and you have a general nonlinearity and some initial and boundary conditions. And so again, if we would use some classical methods such as splitting or exponential integrator methods, they would always um, linearize this interaction between a differential operator and a nonlinearity. And so what we wanted to do is to move away from this linearized frequency interactions and for the KDV equation, we can do this exactly. We can really embed them all in our scheme. However, for, for a more general class, we have to make a little bit of the trade-off. And so basically what the idea is, if we you look at these nonlinear interactions, what, um, uh, what, what we want to do is to filter out the dominant part in these nonlinear interactions and solve the dominant part exactly while only approximating the lower order terms. But of course, then the question is, what is the dominant part in these nonlinear frequency interactions? Okay, so what are the parts we really have to embed in our numerical scheme? And this is exactly where the resonances come into play because the resonances tell us what are, what are the bad terms which we really have to embed. And that's somewhat interesting because I discussed with Bjorn, it's somewhat different in numerical analysis, what are the bad terms and what um, numerical and theoretical analysis is different, which are the bad terms yeah, which we have to control. And so this is somehow the idea, the strategy of this approach, namely, so here I wrote down the equations and the other side, the resonances. And so instead of discretizing really the equation to really um, develop numerical schemes based on underlying structure. <coughs> okay, so maybe now I can show a movie if I have time. Okay, so what we do here. I, I come back to this um, Talbo effect. So what we do is we solve the one D cubic Schrodinger equation with a step function initial value. And then what you what what we see is that for certain time values, we see a quantization effect. And what we want to see is in how far our numerical scheme can we produce this quantization effect. And so in order to be fair, let us first look at the smooth case. Okay, so this is not very interesting, but to say that we really solve the same equation. And so in red, you see this resonance-based approach, and in blue, you see the strength splitting method, and you don't see any, any difference between the lines. And this is somehow on short terms, on short time intervals, and smooth solutions, it does not really make a difference which numerical scheme you use. Okay, so you can use the splitting method, a resonance-based 
exponentially integrate the map that you don't see anything. But then when you look really at rough data, so for instance, if you, if you start with the, with the step function initial value, then you really see a difference. And so what you see, and this is very interesting, I think. So you really see that for certain time steps, and this you can also prove in cert for certain PDEs, um, you see this quantization in the solution, okay? And then the question is, of course, in how far can you reproduce this um, quantization numerically? And what we see is that the blue line, so the strength bit of method gets more and more oscillatory, okay? Whereas our numerical schemes to really seems to produce, reproduce this quantization effect in a much better way. Of course, I have to say then if you go longer in time, also our numerical schemes, so just coming back to your questions, starts to get some oscillations, but I was surprised in how, how well this actually works because here we really have a rough solution and um, our numerical um, scheme seems to reproduce this pattern in a good way. Okay. And then somehow um, um, there were a lot of open questions at this point and in the first read. So if you think about this resonance approach and how I started working of this is which I took every equation. So I took NLS, I took KDV, I looked at the resonances by hand, I built my scheme up to first order. But the question is of course, and this is what we would, you always would like to have in numerical and it's an algorithm, a general algorithm. You give me a PDE and I give you the numerical scheme for it. And a second question is also the error estimates at low regularity. Okay, so it's nice to have simulations, but in the end you would really like to prove um, convergence bounds at low regularity. Then structure preservation. So for instance, if you think about the KDV equations, it's completely integrable. NLS, can you preserve the energy over long time in your scheme? Then also what about non-periodic boundary conditions? So the resonance-based approach was fully based on this, um, on going to Fourier space. So what happens if you no longer have periodic boundary conditions? And then also if you move away from these diversity equations. And so um, um, I would just say a little bit about each of these, uh, the ideas we had for each of these questions. So um, together with Ivan Brunet, we, we were interested in the question whether we can um, construct a general framework for this, for this um, resonance approach. So if we have a general dispersive equation, the question is in how far can I obtain high order methods, which always embed these frequency interactions in the numerical scheme. And so at first order, it's not very difficult. You use the Hummel's formula and then you look at the frequencies, you can write them down by hand and then you build your numerical scheme on that. But then if you want to have higher order methods, you have to iterate, iterate, iterate higher and higher your do Hummel's formula. And you always have to embed your frequency interactions in your numerical scheme. And for instance, if you want to have a method of order 10, you would need to do this. 10. And of course you can do this by hand, but what you would like to have is a general framework. And so the idea was to use a tree series, um, tree series to do this where on the leaves, you take the Fourier coefficients. So this will then allow you to treat all these frequencies. So you take your solution, you express it in Fourier space in a tree series where the decorations of these trees are exactly your frequencies so that you can embed the structure. And then you, you iterate, you do a mass formula up to the order you want. And this you don't forget. Okay, and this just copied. And then what you have to do is of course, so this is an exact, exact, exact representation of the solution up to this order. But then again, we want to do numerics. So we have to discretize it. And the idea is then just to discretize all of these, um, of these integrals in the sense of this resonance approach. So always what I want that my operator IP, the discretization of it, filters out the dominant part, fills the dominant part, and then um, and, and embeds this in the scheme. And interestingly, this, this operator, this integral operator, and its discretization in the spirit of the resonance approach has a big of type factorization, which is close to this SPDs with regularity structures. And this really helped us in the error analysis of the schemes to control in every step the error analysis. Because we always have to keep in mind, if we want to have an error estimate later, we have to keep in mind which of the frequency interactions do I keep, which do I throw away, and the ones I throw away will be essential in my error. And the regularity assumptions there. Okay, then the error analysis. So um, what can we say about the error estimates? And so here again, let me start with the cubic Schrodinger equation. So here is our numerical scheme. 
then the first thing we can do is we can look at the conversions rate again. So I have time step my error. And again, of course, what I want in numerical analysis, I want to use large time steps and I want to have a good error. So I want to be in this wider corner here. And what we compare is again an exponential integrator method, splitting methods, and this resonance based approach. And so what we see is that for this rough data, the exponential integrator method has a very slow, almost um, non conversions at all. So even if I use tiny time step size, I don't get a good approximation. And then what we see is that the error of the splitting method oscillates widely. Okay, so here we can be lucky and have a good time step size and have a small error, but we can also be unlucky and have a, um, a, a bad step size and have a, a large error. And then uh, on the other hand, this resonance based approach really has a nice convergence rate also at no really large. Okay, and so it's nice to produce plots and see this, but in the end, we want to have error estimates. And then if you do not look too closely at the convergence estimate, you think, okay, everything is fine. So what you can really see is that you have less regularity requirements than classic numerical schemes. But then if you take a closer look at your at the error estimates, you will probably think you wasted the last 30 minutes because what you see is that in this error estimate, the only the, what, you, what you need is you can really improve classical methods, but you need, what you need is you have to use, work in high solar space, okay? And of course, this is not very interesting because I'm, I mean, if I have a method which when I measure the error in H10, I only need H11 de derivatives, nobody will use it. Okay, so what I would really like to have is uh, two error bounds because then I, I'm really close to the rough solutions. Oh, where's the initial data for that plot? Well, I or, think, what 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 uh, is it like H1 data or smooth data? Or? No, so this is um H1, the error is measured in H1, and uh, the, the data is H2. Okay. And so basically this is what we show we need one additional derivative on the solution in order to have full convergence and then you can have fractional convergence if you are the one. <laughs> but the, the, the problem is if, if, if you, and this is not only a problem for this resonance based approach, but also for classical things. In the classical numerical analysis, we use smooth solar spaces because then we don't have to, a problem to estimate the products. Okay. And, and again, this is somehow due to the fact that all this error estimate stems from linear ODEs. Okay, and then they were just took to PDEs and, and then everything works well if you're in smooth super spaces. And so basically what I want to say with this is that what you can do with this resonance space approach, you can really optimize the local error because you don't just linearize frequency interactions, but you embed them. But then if you want to have a global error estimate, then you really have to also work to obtain the stability in your numerical. And then if you want to know about the stability in the numerical scheme, basically you have to turn to the um, theoretical analysis of PDEs, okay? Because basically you have the same problem if you look at the well-posedness of dispersive equations in low regularity spaces, you cannot take the bilinear estimates. And then what is the essential tool? The essential tool are Strichert's estimates. Okay. But so basically, so you know, uh, in the Strichert's estimates, you know that you gain in integrability thanks to the Schrödinger flow. But now the problem is, so what was very much used in numerical analysis uh, is the parabolic smoothing property, because the parabolic smoothing property is something pointwise. So this you can easily use in the end, you write down your scheme, the iteration, and then you pointwise have the smoothing, so you know you gain. But then the problem is here in the Strichert's estimates that you, yeah, that you do not have pointwise estimates. Okay, and so for a long time, it was really an open question whether this a discretized version of Strichert's estimates actually exists. Okay. So again, for parallel probably it's no problem. You, you don't have to do anything. Basically, you write down and then you use in the end point was the estimate, but it was. And so I think the first ones who really um, um, took this problem and showed that indeed these Strichert estimates do not hold true like this in the discrete setting. So discrete, I want to say I discretize in time. Okay. So I'm, I always have the discrete time points n times tau, where tau is my time step size. And so um, 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 the first ones who, 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 um, who looked at this question, up to my knowledge, are Inat and Enrique Swaswa. And so they could show that these Strichert's estimates do not hold true on the discrete level. However, a filtered version is true. Okay, so basically what you have to do is you have to take your function and then you have to make a frequency truncation. Okay, and then you can propagate it with your discrete flow. And then you get something like Strichert's estimates, but a little bit weaker than the continuous ones. Okay. 
And um, so Enrique and Ignan, they, they, they use these Strichertz estimates or Strichertz type estimates um, to show L2 error estimates for splitting methods for the cubic and LS equation. But what they required are still H2 solutions and in dimensions smaller or equal to three. So again, we are a little bit um, in, in a smooth setting. But then, of course, the question is, what happens if, we're, if I'm really in a setting where I have solutions in H field? Okay, so I'm below the, the I'm below the, the, the classical bilinear estimates. And so um, um, uh, we 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 could we could manipulate with the Strichertz estimates to choose the discretization in, in the, the cutoff in a Fourier space and your time step size in a certain way. And if you optimize this in a good way, then you can really obtain L2 error estimates for your solution with a convergence rate. So the convergence rate is not the full convergence rate because you lose in your Strichertz estimate. If you, if you look at the discretized version of Strichertz estimates, but you can really go down to H sigma sigma larger than zero and obtain an error estimate, which with classical methods, you always push to T plus epsilon over T over two plus epsilon. Okay, and so basically the strategy is here, you take your solution and you project because you cannot use the Strichertz estimates, you have to truncate in Fourier space. And then, but this is nothing, uh, this is nothing wrong because in the end, if you solve your PDE, you use a spectral method or something, so you have to cut off anyway, anyway, your frequencies. And then you apply your resonance space approach. And then, so uh, uh, you can also do this in the topics. Okay, and now in the last remaining, Section. So this was so 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 what you, you you lose a little bit. You don't get the full conversions, but you can say something really and control the L two. But again, I have to say the constant here depends on t on capital T. So it's not the global error estimate. And then so what what what, what uh, some of you already asked was what is about long time? What can I say about long time evolutions? And for the model, what we cannot say about long time um, global estimates on the error of the solution itself. So I think this is an open problem. But what we can say is at least about the energy conservation, okay, with tools from backward error analysis. And so, um, for instance, here we, we have the cubic NLS equation. And what we, what, we, what, what we know, of course, is that we have an energy in the system. And now the question is in how far does my numerical scheme preserve this energy? Okay, and so what we see is, is time, and here time is really large. Okay, for numeric standards, it's large. And then what we see is the error in the energy for different methods. So first we take the strength splitting method. Okay, and interestingly, because everybody always says the strength splitting method is a syntactic method, it's a, it's a very good structure preserving method. But what we see if you go to H2 data, that the energy explodes. Okay. Although you have energy conservation in, I'm sorry, do you see the yellow line? Probably yellow was not the best. No, not that much. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I have a zoom there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's somewhat surprising because if you work with strength split methods, people always say it's a very good method and very structure preserving, but you see that if you go to low regularity, it does not preserve the energy. And it's not H2, probably for PD people, it's not low regularity at all. So. Okay, and then, um, then there's the method with Ivan together, so this um, resonance space scheme, and then we see, okay, the energy stays bounded, but also it doesn't help because it's the error. So when you, when you make an error of one, uh, you could take just approximately by, by constant, so it also doesn't help at all. Okay, so you, it doesn't blow up like the strength splitting method, but you also don't have any energy conservation over long times. Okay, over short, very short terms here, you could say. Okay. <laughs> And then what we did is we used the resonance approach and then we tried to, to symmetrize the method because we know in numerical analysis that symmetrized methods preserve better the structure of the, of the underlying problem. And then we see that we really have long time. But again, at some point, if we would go on and on and on, at some point also our method, I have to be fair, would get a drift. Why do, you, why, do, why do you have these downward? Yeah, I don't know. This is, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very good question, but for the moment, this we don't know. We are happy we don't have it upwards. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only thing I can say for the moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's some resonances also in the in the structure. 
Okay. And then, of course, to be fair, let's go to the smooth setting. Okay. So in the smooth setting, we see again the energy preservation. Let me start with the method, the first method with Ivan. And so we see that it, the energy stays bounded, but we also don't have any energy preservation, okay, because the arrow goes to one. And then we see that the, the symmetrized resonance-based method also has a nice energy conservation. And then for smooth solutions, also the Spanx PT method had, seems to have a nice energy preservation. But then um, uh, what, 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 what I took here, of course, you always have to see what time discretization and what spatial discretization you use. So basically, where do you do your cutoff here in the frequencies? And here I use very few grid points. So basically you can say I solve an ODE and not the PDE because the more grid points I use, the more frequencies are in my system, the closer and closer I come to an actual PDE. And so here I see infinity data, a few grid points, I'm in the ODE setting. And then surprisingly, if I take more grid points, so I come from ODE to PDE, then, sorry, it's again here in yellow, I have assumed then my, my strength settings, again, the energy goes up. Okay, so even for our C infinity solutions, the strength splitting scheme, if you're in the regime of PDs, doesn't seem to preserve very well the energy. And so what you would need to do is you would really need, again, to have some kind of CFL condition where you, sorry, probably you don't see this, where you couple the time step size and your spatial discretizations. But this is not what you want because as soon as you're in this regime, you solve an ODE, so you could use some classical methods too. Okay. And here, okay, I have a zoom, so now you actually, everybody sees what is happening here. So here you see that, so here's a zoom on the small time intervals here with 240, and you see that the, the strength splitting gets the drift and then really explodes in energy. Uh, but you're, you're always discretizing in time, is that right? Or? Yes, and I use a spectral method in space. Yeah. And what I do is from the ODE to PDE, I, I take more and more frequencies in my system. But presumably by discretizing in time, you have the danger of effectively putting in some kind of periodic driving. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that, that's really what's responsible for these, these, uh, these growth. Yes. Effects. But surprisingly, we don't have it, so we seem to have it for our method for this yeah, resonance space. Right. So I don't understand now. I'm very happy for it, but I cannot say why. So for, for the strength splitting method, more is known. You can do some backward error analysis and you can somehow. You're not, you're not getting any increase in time. Oh, am I missing something in the... You mean a drift? Yeah. With our method? Yeah. I think if you would go on, you would get at some point some. Like, yeah, because it's not exactly energy preserving, so I think at some point it should get a drift, I would say. Do you ever run it? So do you actually see the drift? It's like 4,000 the maximum you can actually do. No, we didn't do it long enough. Okay. We were so happy, so we just wanted to be happy for him. Yeah, we, we were happy. So on the left, left of like, how long does this run? A few days, I would say. Okay. And then, of course, next we want to go to higher dimensions. I mean, this is only here yeah, to say what's going on. But I cannot explain why we were very happy about that. Because, I mean, it's very hard, I think, to beat strengths within that one. Like, if you're working with specific equations, it's very hard because people Okay, and so um, the, the last couple of minutes, maybe let me shortly mention also that what happens beyond periodic boundary conditions, so what one would think is that, it, that everything is really tailor suited to, to free space, to panel linear frequency, and to, to really, uh, what you can do, the frequencies you really understand if you have periodic boundary conditions because you can write down how the oscillations look like, but then what you can ha happen to non-periodic boundary conditions, so if you have a general differential operator, uh, a uh, general evolution equation, DTU plus LU is FU, and you have a general domain, so not necessarily boundary, periodic boundary conditions. And then what we can actually do is we can also construct this low regularity integrator where we have some certain conditions on the operator. Um, we have, uh, we need that it um, generates a quadratic semi-group because we have the exponentials in the scheme, otherwise we would have no stability in our numerical scheme. Then we have minus L plus L bar, in our numerical scheme in the exponentials, we will also need that this generates a unitary group. And then interestingly, to control the, free, the oscillations, we have to have a, a, a certain structure of the nonlinearity where we can distinguish where u and u borrows, okay, because the oscillations go in different directions. 
But basically, in this general setting, we can construct these low regularity integrators. So, what we look more closely is this heat NLS and Navier Stokes. And then you can improve the, the regularity assumptions compared to classical scheme. Okay, and so basically, you can always get something better with this low regularity integrator if you have some kind of, of Leibniz rule for your underlying model. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say. And so, of course, um, um, what would be interesting is what, what, what I didn't go into detail in some discussions, we went more into detail is, um, so for KDV, I can embed all the frequencies, but otherwise I have to do some frequency approximation, only take the dominant parts, approximate the lower order parts. But ultimately what we would like to do is to really stay close to the structure, of the PD, and then I think we have really a chance to show global error, uh, global in time error estimates is to embed all or at least more frequencies in our discretization. Then what people in PDE often ask me is whether one can use these schemes to have rigorous low up simulations. So if I don't know whether I have global blockbusters or not, but um, um, that's a very difficult problem numerically because in the end you see a blow up, but then you have to make sure you track a blow up in the PDE and it's not an instability in your numerical scheme. So that's for instance, if you see the strength the energy blows up, I mean, it's a numerical effect. It's not really that the energy. And then a long time structure preservation. So can we show what this, the, 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 why the method works well over long times to preserve energy? And then numerically, again, what would be nice is to really have a toolbox in MATLAB where people can just like only put the methods. Use this. And so basically, I think one of the driving questions in this area is how and to what extent can we reproduce the qualitative behavior of nonlinear PDEs in a finite? Dimensional discretize. So I thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Uh, I'd like to see what uh, you start off with the step function, right? Yes. So what, what happens there? I, I didn't quite understand. You've got this quantization. Yes. Yeah, see, I have a quantity. I don't know, Pion, if you know this Talbot effect. Yeah, it, it's, it's this Talbot effect thing, like uh, Adodon, for instance, works well on this, yes. like Steve Arkes and so on. Yeah. Like, it's this funny thing where, like, uh, for data like this, if you propagate by, like, a, a rational time, you get exactly these kind of quantization things, basically. So, like, I mean, you, you kind of saw this where, like, out of nowhere, you got this, like, almost periodic shape where you get, like, one outlook there and one outlook there. This, like, happens exactly at rational times. It's, like, a funny thing that you can see when you look at the Fourier ones. Um, but it's of course hard to see because like, you know, you only see it at rational times. So like if you're at a near about irrational time, you're not supposed to see it. Uh, and that's of course very hard because how do you tell your computer, oh, you know, it's not actually an irrational time. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. I don't understand it very well, but you kind of see it by playing around with Fourier series. It's special to, it's special to- uh, It's special to MLS, I think. Yeah. And KDB, yeah. KDB or KDB, KDB too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's not, yeah. I only know KDV and yeah. yeah. It's definitely it's definitely also exists for MLS. But it's nice to test your methods. So. Yeah. And I've not forgotten, but it does it physicists also care. But I forgot why. Like it's not it, I think physicists actually saw this first and then mathematicians try to work with us. Like it's not playing around with irrational numbers, which we sometimes do. <laughs> Um, if you study KDV with weak dispersion, like if you have epsilon in front of your dispersion, and you take, you know, work with small epsilon, are your methods well adapted to studying that problem? I would think so, at least that's a, maybe with lots of, a little bit of loss of convergence, but otherwise I would guess so, because it then ends the frequencies and then you would just adapt it also in your, uh, in the nonlinear interactions, right? Because it's pretty interesting. I had a question on like the um, one of the later parts, uh, the circuit part. Yeah. So like, if you think of like continuous time circuit estimates, it tells you that like on average in time you'll do better than like solo from betting. Yeah. Right. So that's why you have like LTP. Yeah. Um, and now when you work on this, like you still did this kind of tall time step, and you did like some kind of discrete time norm. Yeah. You sum up kind of in, yeah, yeah, in yeah, that. Yeah. Right. But of course now this tall could be unfortunate. Like if you do try to do it for every tall, you could be exactly hitting kind of the Times. Yeah. So in a scheme like this or an error analysis like this, could you kind of either improve like the method or the balance by choosing kind of a random time step? So instead of like going tall, could you go from like one half tall to two tall somehow randomly? But like with a high probability, you would get like the average case behavior. 
Right. Right. So yeah, in this yeah, case, yeah. like you would reverse kind of more the like continuous time out, you know. Yes. Um, that would be interesting. Yes. We once thought about it, yeah. especially because then um, if you show this convergence rate, you want to know whether it's sharp and it's not sharp. Okay. So so there's I think uh, room to play, but probably because we don't hit the worst tau, like yeah. if you take a simulation or two, yeah. it's, it's an interest. Yeah, yeah. But right, because like you could have like kind of bubbles that focus exactly at the time. Yes. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You made any higher dimensional simulation? Not yet, but we are, especially for the energy. But for priority boundary position, it should be uh, easy, but then if you go at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you. Thank you very much.